Good evening, everybody. I am Janice Kamina Resnick. Thank you so much for tuning in to tonight's America at a Crossroads program featuring the terrific Ron Brownstein and Pat Morrison. And because of the violent conflict unfolding in Israel at 6 p.m. immediately following tonight's scheduled program with Ron Brownstein, we are pleased to have been able to arrange for Ambassador Dennis Ross, who worked on Middle East diplomacy under four presidents and who continues to do so as a fellow at the Washington Institute, will be with us. There will be no break in the program. We will go directly from the conclusion of Ron Brownstein at 6 p.m. to Dennis Ross, so you will want to stay tuned in for that additional half hour. For those of you who are newcomers to this weekly series, this is a joint venture of Jews United for Democracy and Justice and Community Advocates, Inc. Our leadership team, which works tirelessly to bring you these programs, are Zev Yaroslavsky, Mel Levine, Rabbi Ken Chazen, Caroline Kelly, David Lair, and myself. And I wanna thank you to the many wonderful co-sponsors. Their names were posted before the program began. We have some great programs coming up in the next several weeks. Next week is Cancel Culture and the, uh, as the topic with Brett Stevens and Michelle Goldberg, both of the New York Times in conversation with Larry Mantle. We will then be focusing on the all important filibuster. Just in the next month or two, amongst the long list of guests, we will be hosting Brett Stevens with Michelle Goldberg, Congressman Adam Kinzinger, constitutional law scholar, Erwin Shemarinsky, Holocaust scholar Deborah Lipstadt with Rabbi Ed Feinstein, Bill Crystal, former, former GOP Chairman Michael Steele, former Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen, Admiral Mike Mullen, and many more. And that's just a partial listing. Uh, topics from cancel culture to filibuster to white supremacy in the military to political satire and its impact on the body politic. You can register in the email which comes after the program for most of these programs. Be sure to keep an eye out for them. We'll be posting more during the course of this week. This week, Jews all over the world will be celebrating Shavuot, the time we celebrate the receiving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai, a group of Hebrew slaves fleeing slavery transformed themselves into the Jewish people by accepting a covenant, a covenant which was principally concerned with interpersonal relationships and mutual responsibilities. <laughs> While the Torah affirms that we are each individuals responsible for our own actions, the Torah also mandates communal responsibility, which we have duties, we have duties towards the welfare of our entire community. So it is with the United States. Yes, America was founded on the principle of individual liberties matched by individual responsibilities, but also inherent in our country's founding was something very close to a covenantal rela relationship, where we are all responsible to protect the freedoms and rights of the other. When Jews United for Democracy was, was founded, it rested on the principle that core Jewish values and core American democratic values were not only in sync, but in many ways were coterminous. Almost four years later, we believe that now more than ever, we believe that now more than ever, and that is why we continue to bring these programs on critical subjects, subjects that bear directly on that notion, as aspirational as it might be, that Americans have a covenant to protect the freedoms and rights of the other. There is no better time than Shavuot to recognize, to recognize, respect, and honor our covenantal bond to Torah and to our American democracy. To those who celebrate, happy Shavuot, Chag Sameach. And now to introduce tonight's guest, please welcome my colleague and friend, David Lehrer. Thank you, Janice. I'm pleased to join you in once again welcoming all of you, the audience to America at a Crossroads. Tonight, as you mentioned, is the first for our series, a double header a long scheduled discussion on the intersection of culture, the arts and politics with a man who has literally written the book on the topic will occupy our first hour. In response to numerous calls and emails asking for more information about what is transpiring in the Middle East, we'll then host a half hour with a man who has probably done more critical negotiation with the parties now at war than anyone else, with the possible exception of Henry Kissinger, Dennis Ross. We begin with Ron Brownstein, the frequent guest on these broadcasts and the author of the New York Times bestseller, Rock Me on the Water. It's a history of the year 1974 and how the films, music, TV industry, and cultural milieu of Los Angeles had a profound impact on American society for many years. Tonight, he will discuss what pop popular culture tells us about politics and the world around us, a relationship and symbiosis that we should keep in mind with the dizzying events of today. The hour with Ron will be followed by a half hour with Ambassador Dennis Ross, as Janice mentioned. He will discuss events in the Middle East that have devolved into a shooting war between Israel and her Palestinian neighbors, literally neighbors and across the borders. Ambassador Ross has unmatched credentials when it comes to understanding and contextualizing events in the Middle East. 
He's been involved in negotiations there since the Carter administration. There simply is no one better to offer a perspective on what current events mean than Ross. We were extremely fortunate to be able to secure him just this morning. They will both be interviewed by one of our most frequent hosts, the incomparable Pat Morrison. In addition to being a renowned Pulitzer Prize winning columnist for the LA Times, she's a best-selling author, an award-winning TV host and radio broadcaster, and one of our favorite moderators. Pat? Well, thank you, Janice, and thank you, David. Um, you may remember, if you're of a certain age and generation, the 1973-1974, the eyes of the, the, eyes of the nation. nation and the world are turned to Washington, to the White House, where Richard Nixon is fighting a rearguard action against the Watergate scandal, and to Capitol Hill, where that's being investigated. But there were big events, culturally seismic events that were going on 3,000 miles away here in Los Angeles too. And these events, like Watergate, resonate to this day. And the music we hear, the music, or the movies and the television that we watch, and the brand of politics that has been singularly Californian, that has been scaled up to a national level. Ron Brownstein writes about them all in his new book, Rock Me on the Water, 1974, the year Los Angeles transformed movies, music, television, and politics. Ron is, of course, a longtime political reporter, author of a half dozen books, a former colleague of mine at the LA Times, now a senior editor at The Atlantic, senior political analyst for CNN. In short, he knows what he's talking about. Ron, thank you so much. Pat, good to be with you. Good to see you again. Watergate casts such a long shadow that that's what we think of when we think of this era. What was your epiphany in putting all these pieces together and finding the singularity that was 1974 on the West Coast? You know, uh, first of all, thank you. And thank you for doing this. Thanks for uh, uh, Janice, David, everybody else, Zav Mel, for, for having me back and all of you for uh, uh, tuning in or I don't know what the proper verb is actually for signing on. Um, you know, I think my understanding of the story really progressed in two, uh, two uh, segments. It's almost like a, uh, an archeological dig. Um, the first thing that really struck me about this period in LA was just the sheer constellation of talent, right? I mean, I had written a book uh, 30 years ago, if that's possible, called The Power and the Glitter, which was a history of the relationship between Washington and politics. And from that book, I knew, as anybody knows who writes about Hollywood, that the late 60s and early 70s in the movie industry was considered one of the two golden ages uh, for film production, along with the period right around World War II, roughly from Wizard of Oz uh, to uh, It's a Wonderful for life in the first case and then in the more you know the, in the modern case graduate and bonnie and clyde through maybe a uh, network and one flew over the cuckoo's nest so i knew there was uh, this great period in Hollywood in the early 70s. And then when and I had that kind of in my mental back pocket when I moved to back to LA from DC, where I spent much of my career. I moved back here in 2014. When I got back out here, uh, I started listening more to the LA music of the early 1970s, whether it was Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, or Joni Mitchell, or Linda Ronstadt, the Eagles, um, Jackson Brown, obviously. And I remember thinking, that's kind of interesting. All of that is happening even while the movie stuff is happening. But the last Tumblr kind of clicked into place for me um, on this, um, uh, when I attended a political event uh, at Norman Lear's house, I, it was it was for Elizabeth Warren, uh, kind of early, kind of, you know, moving around the country thinking about uh, running for president. And I, re I distinctly remember as we were driving home after thinking, okay, now wait a minute, Norman Lear was doing All in the Family at the same time as Jackson Brown and Linda Ronstadt and, and all of them were, were active. And at the same time that Hollywood was going through this renaissance with the Godfather one and two in Chinatown and five easy pieces and uh, carnal knowledge, um, McCabe and Mrs. Miller. And I began to series. So that was the, what drew me to this first was that was just that there was incredible constellation of talent all operating in the same place at the same time, which struck me as unique. But as I got deeper into the story, there was a deeper kind of archaeological level uh, layer. And really, that layer is 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 in many ways the, the great lasting significance of this period in L.A., because it was in the early 1970s. It was in the pop culture of the early 1970s in a process that culminated in 1974, that the critique of American life, the new ideas about American life that emerged in the social movements of the 60s, it was then that they were cemented, I think, irrevocably into popular culture. And, and as a result, really became the bridge between these ideas that were insurrectionary in the 60s and the mass American audience and, and the lever by which the way we lived our daily lives changed. And that is the story that I ultimately told in Rock Me on the Water.
what struck me was how you constructed some of the tensions that were going on within each of the of the media that you talk about. For example, in in movies, you had in even in the '60s when the world was going up in flames, you had the best pictures were My Fair Lady and The Sound of Music and yeah. Oliver of all yeah. things. Right. And yet, pulling the other way were the kind of films that you were talking about. We had, we had Chinatown and we would end up having Nashville and uh, Midnight Cowboy, movies yeah. that were really out there for a lot of America. And, and then in the middle of this, this cultural taffy pull, which is, seemed like what it was in the movie industry, you had the conflict between older filmmakers like yeah. Robert Altman, who were interested in social commentary, or you had Roman Polanski, who, as I remember, had been in a concentration camp and who made Chinatown, mm -hmm. and new filmmakers like Spielberg, who made, well, let's you know, let's have Jaws or um, uh, you know, let's have Star Wars or American Graffiti. So the, the taffy pull, I think, is an interesting idea because it's it's cultural and it's generational in a way you hadn't expected. Can right. you talk about that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, first of all, we'll talk about music in in a minute because the music. Uh, situation is different for, for yes. reasons that I'll explain. But in the TV networks and the movie studios had the same response to the 1960s, during the 1960s, which was to ignore it as much as possible. Um, you know, as I say in the book, uh, Walter Cronkite would spend half an hour uh, chronicling all of the new fissures and tensions and changes that were rumbling through American life. And then CBS and the other two networks would spend the next three and a half hours trying to erase all of that from people's minds. I mean, in the 60s, the shows we got, particularly from CBS, which was the dominant network, were Beverly Hillbillies and Petticoat Junction uh, and Green Acres and The Andy Griffith Show and Lucy and Doris Day and Ed Sullivan. Uh, we didn't get any closer to Vietnam than Gomer Pyle and McHale's Navy uh, and Hogan's Heroes. Uh, and the studios really weren't that different for most of the decade. There were certainly some great movies made, uh, but they tended to be ones that were very disconnected from all of the new stirrings in American life, My Fair Lady, Sound of Music, The Longest Day, epics about World War II, The Great Escape, which I love, but you know, was not really uh, tied to contemporary life other than Steve McQueen's motorcycle ride, I suppose, in its, uh, in its own way. Both of them were kind of operating on the theory uh, that um, uh, 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 what was articulated most clearly in television, the idea of the least objectionable program, that you needed audiences so big at that point to be viable uh, that essentially you wanted to be you wanted to produce things that were not offensive to anyone and in practice that gave a veto uh, to the most culturally traditional rural uh, you know, kind of parts of the country. And so you got this endless assembling line of TV shows uh, that were about the simple virtues of rural life. And you got movies that were, uh, you know, kind of uh, looked away from anything that might be uh, divisive. That begins to change in the late 60s. And then really, the change really accelerates in the early 1970s on both fronts. On TV, you get Mary Tyler Moore going on the air in the fall of 1970, which begins to look at the changing role of women. But on Obviously, the big bang event, the, the turning point in the history of television is January 1971, when CBS puts All in the Family on the air and establishes irrevocably the idea that the medium was a fit platform from which to comment on the society around it. And then in the movie industry, you get Bonnie and Clyde and The Graduate in 67, but even that's kind of a false dawn. It's not until Easy Rider and Midnight Cowboy and then very much accelerating in the early 70s with some of those movies that we talked about, uh, including Chinatown uh, and The Godfather. And really what happened, Pat, was I think the same thing on both fronts, which is that uh, increasingly those two giant entertainment industries felt that they had to change their product line to more reflect the values and experiences of the baby boomers who were becoming an increasing part of their audience. And in that way, I argue in the book, the culture reflected some of these changes in the 1960s more quickly than the politics did. Because Nixon, I mean, the paradox of this period, as I'm sure we'll talk about, is that Nixon won two national elections by mobilizing the voters most uneasy with the way the country was changing, precisely at the same time as those ideas, those same ideas were cementing themselves into popular culture and thus beginning to change the way we actually live. Well, the, the, the programs that Norman Lear eventually dominated television with, starting with All in the Family, really dragged the private discussions into a public domain and put them in a setting where 
the water cooler next day, everybody would be talking about all in the family and the language that Archie used and his arguments with his son-in-law. And so that really brought to the fore a sense of this is important. Everybody's talking about this if it's on television. Yeah, yeah, really, really perceptive point. I am struck at, you know, everything I've done since this book, and the book covers a lot. It covers Linda Ronstadt and Joni Mitchell and Jackson Brown and Chinatown and Shampoo and Nashville and Jaws. Uh, and and obviously uh, Mash and Mary Tyler Moore, but but the but the single thing that people have most asked me about or most kind of commented on was all in the family, because I think for million first of all the audience was enormous as many as forty million people may have been watching it every week and it was a kind of concentrated experience um, uh, in a way that our fractionated media environment no longer provides, but people recognized it at, even at the time as something different, something unlike they had ever seen. And so many people have talked to me about watching it with their parents, uh, you know, in the early 1970s, particularly when it was on that Saturday Night lineup that included Mary Tyler Moore and MASH in that one year of 1973, 1974. Um, you go back and watch that first episode of All in the Family, and it is like a rock coming through the TV screen still 50 years later. It is or astonishing. Or room window. It threw, right. It is astonishing to hear the things that Archie says. And really, you know, what All in the Family does is it reduces the entire, it condenses really, the entire generational conflict of the 60s into a single living room and kind of locks you in there as these issues are fought out, as you know, in real time. I mean, I'm not sure if people watching Lucy would ever know who the president was from the Lucille, the various incarnations of I Love Lucy or the Lucille Ball Show. But Mike and Archie argued about Watergate. You know, they argued about civil rights. They argued about things that were happening that day. It was TV that was happening, you know, in your life in a way that had not been before. And the great irony of all of this is it, it, in some ways, one of my favorite chapters in the book is explaining how the two people who were most responsible for putting this on the air, Norman Lear, who we all remember, uh, and Robert Wood, who very few people do remember, who came out of KNX and then KNXT here in LA and became the president of CBS, each of them were really unlikely revolutionaries. I mean, Norman is now, you know, justifiably recognized as such a visionary for his TV work in the 60s that it's easy to forget there was very little in his work before All in the Family that would have led you to believe this was the guy who was going to revolutionize television. I mean, him and Bud Yorkin had done the Andy Williams show and Come Blow Your Horn and The Night They Raided Minsky's um, uh, Divorce American Style. There really wasn't uh, uh, you know, a long pedigree, but he found in this story of the bigoted father-in-law and the liberal son, an echo of his own experience with his father, and in his mid-40s, found a voice that was more urgent and contemporary than he had ever uh, produced earlier. And then Robert Wood, Robert Wood, a USC graduate, a football fan, a Nixon fan, a Reagan fan, a critic of the student demonstrators, becomes the president of CBS, cancels the Smothers Brothers, hardly a flaming liberal, hardly someone who saw it as his role to transform television, but ultimately he recognized that they had to get urban and more urban and more and younger in order to compete. And that led him to open the door to this really transformational moment in television history. So let's Let's talk about music, because when we think of music in the 60s, first we have sort of anodyne Beach Boys music, yes. then we have the British invasion, and then 10 years after the Beatles come here, here is this renaissance, not in New York, not at Columbia Records, which is Bob Dylan's mm -hmm. home, but in Los Angeles, where the living's easy and they're just having a good time with their guitars. Yep, absolutely. I mean, L.A. becomes the absolute center of the music world for a brief window in the early 1970s. As you say, uh, in the mid 60s, it was certainly in, in England, you know, I mean, it was it was the Beatles and the Stones and then everybody else kind of on the rungs below them. There was kind of a brief moment of the summer of love in San Francisco, but gradually through the late 60s and early 70s, again, culminating in this kind of magical year of 1974. In 1974, Joni Mitchell with Court and Spark, uh, Jackson Brown with uh, Late for the Sky, 
uh, uh, the Eagles with On the Border and Linda Ronstadt with Heart Like a Wheel all put out career redefining albums. David Geffen, who was here at Asylum Records and, and actually you know, released all of those records, also engineered reunion tours for Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young and, they, and Bob Dylan and the band that year that uh, set records um, uh, of attendance. I mean, really the CSNY tour is the first full scale stadium tour uh, ever and another reflection of the growing power of the uh, buying power of the baby boom that you could put something together of that magnitude. Uh, and LA was kind of uh, really the, the, the cultural center of, 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 of the music industry at that point, because I, you know, I, I argue that if there is one common theme through all of the pop culture of the early 1970s, whether it's movies, music, and television. A lot of things are obviously happening, but I think there is a common thread through all of them. And the common thread is grappling with the question of what of the ideals of the 60s could be preserved in what was clearly a very different political and social environment in the 1970s. And uh, in many ways, I think the, the LA musicians, although their, their political message was not as focused or direct uh, as, as what we saw in All in the Family or say Chinatown or Nashville. Um, the question they grapple with was what, is it, what did it mean to live a more authentic life uh, than your parents' uh, generation? Um, it, was in, it was in many ways, I thought a continuation of the, of the uh, you know, I, I've said this, that the, if there's a common theme in LA music in the 1970s, it's Dustin Hoffman in, uh, in the pool scene at the graduate when the father's friend says plastics to him. And they're, they're kind of looking for a more authentic way to live, what, what Joni Mitchell and Woodstock called, you know, uh, a way back to the garden. And, and I think that while that question was still dominating pop culture, LA was the center of the music world. As you get to the mid seventies and, and things get darker, you begin to see musical influence move out of LA, which is still sunny and mostly optimistic toward the darker vision of kind of the punk rock movement that uh, you know, incubates on the lower east side of Manhattan, which is in every way kind of the polar opposite of what's happening in LA in the early 1970s. And of course, from there, it moves on to, uh, to London. And you have this bifurcation in the music world. On the one hand, the kind of the darker vision of the punks. And on the other, the, the kind of escapism and entertainment of disco, which is in its own way, I think the equivalent of the escapism and entertainment that came on television with Happy Days and Charlie's Angels and Three's Company. And then in movies with the rise of the blockbuster like Jaws and Star Wars. Before we move on to politics, I want to specific to movies, television, music. It was the words aren't too strong, although the attitudes were laudable. The result was still no different in terms of sexism and racism yeah. in how these products got to the screen, got to the records. Um, movies and television about women did not have women working on them. They did yeah. not have black people working on them. And as you also point out, there's a remark from Linda Ronstadt, who just herself was not aware of how powerless women were in the music industry. She said, she just, I thought, I'm here, I'm doing it, cool. Yeah, well, you know, uh, the, the story of the early 1970s is on the one hand, the door cracking open in front of the camera. And for the, you know, you begin to see more, whether it's TV shows or movies that portrayed the experiences of people of color, mostly African-Americans at that point, uh, or women. So you did have the Mary Tyler Moore show and you did have Maude and you had Jefferson's and you had Good Times and you had Alice doesn't live here anymore. Uh, but almost all of those cultural products were still controlled by white men. Um, there were very few women writers on any of them. Um, even Mary Tyler Moore, which had the most, um, it was relatively modest. All in the family, it was tiny, mash, it was tiny. I'm not sure there was ever a woman who directed an episode of All in the Family uh, off the top of, I think, it, I think there may have been none. And I don't believe there are any on MASH either. Joan Darling, who directed the classic, maybe the greatest Mary Tyler Moore episode of all, uh, you know, the, the death of Chuckles the Clown. Um, uh, you know, she was one of the only women working as a director uh, on TV and in, and in film, uh, after Elaine May got a few uh, bites at the apple, uh, there was almost no one again through the mid 1970s. And I tell the story in the book of what a struggle it was, a kind of clawing and pushing to try to get in the door at all for kind of 
early generation of uh, women and, and, and African-American uh, artists, whether it's um, Joan Darling or Linda Bloodworth Thomason or Mary Kay Place or executives uh, like Sherry Lansing. Um, and this was kind of the, the, the paradox or the, or the, or the um, hypocrisy of the era, which is that you saw more of, of those other stories beginning to emerge on TV, but they were still basically controlled by white men and older white men at that, uh, you know, across these industries. And obviously that's a battle that is still uh, going on today. But I think today there is more pressure that when the stories are kind of reflecting panoramic experience, the people writing and directing or producing it uh, uh, should, should do so as well. I guess that goes up to a certain level and above that it's still mostly a white world. Well, and, and the sense was by the people who were creating these groundbreaking shows that had liberated women that had, you know, black figures in them was the sense of, look at what we're doing. Why yeah. are you upset with us? Yeah, look, Norman Lear got picketed uh, when he was getting a civil rights award in 1975 by black screenwriters. And in some ways, it, you know, his, his mystification at that was justified. He was like, well, I am putting, you know, black experiences on the screen. It's not like anybody else is giving jobs uh, to black screenwriters uh, or, you know, and they're not even telling those stories. But this became a source of great tension, particularly on the set of Good Times. Uh, that was where I think it really, uh, you know, um, kind of uh, crystallized. Um, and there was this weird subculture uh, at the time of the black flotation movies, which were intensely controversial in the black community. And these was like some 200 films that were made over a short period in the early 1970s uh, with black protagonists, movies like Shaft and Superfly and Foxy Brown and Coffee, all the Pam Greer movies. Um, and on the one hand, these were movies that gave a lot of work to black actors, writers, and directors, and, and even craftspeople, and also often portrayed very confident independent black protagonists who moved with uh, a great deal of authority between the white world and the black world. Often the, the, the white characters they come in contact with are corrupt and oppressive and the black characters stand up to them in a way that you uh, had not really seen on screen before. So like in the, in the Pam Greer movies, I mean, whether it's Foxy Brown or Coffee, I mean, she takes vengeance against corrupt white figures in a way that, you know, you would not have seen, I don't think five years uh, earlier. On the other hand, she spent half of each movie with her top off, right? So that was kind of the other part. I mean, it kind of kind of undermined the case of, for this as, as a form of social commentary. And there was intense resistance from aspects of the civil rights movement about these movies. who thought that they, uh, uh, you know, um, what encouraged stereotypes or propagated stereotypes. And they were very divisive in the black community. They kind of hit the wall when the Hollywood and, and kind of petered out both because of the external pressure, but also because Hollywood realized that black audiences were as likely as white audiences to flock to the new blockbusters. And you, do, you didn't really need a separate product line uh, uh, to reach them. And in that way, they kind of suffered the same fate as the socially aware social commentary movies of the early 1970s that I write about. Let's talk about the politics and the singularity of California politics and what it created and what it brought to national politics. There are four figures that in your book really capture where the, the, the threads begin to cross and to even braid together. Um, Warren Beatty, who of course was a powerful Hollywood figure, but also a powerful political figure who was able to cross that line, who was very knowledgeable and adept in dealing with both worlds. There were Tom Hayden, um, you know, from, from the Chicago Seven, and Jane Fonda. Jane Fonda had been radically against the Vietnam War. Right. Tom was too. But together, they created a different kind of political, um, I don't know, lightning rod. And then they too started to think about working inside the mm -hmm. system, even as the system itself was seeing the wheels come off. And the third is Jerry Brown, yeah. whom I don't think of as counterculture so much as a contrarian culture, yeah. who comes into office in 1974, youngest governor in modern California history, and a guy who is much mocked, but whose ideas are way advanced as we, of course, in hindsight came to know. Yeah, so as I, as I said before, I thought the central question in pop culture of the early 1970s was what of the ideals, what are the hopes for change of the 60s could be preserved and made relevant in the 1970s. And Jerry Brown, Tom Hayden, Jane Fonda, and I suppose in his own way, Warren Beatty 
are all manifestations of that same question being applied to politics. Jerry Brown was not a baby boomer born in 38, but because he spent three years in seminary, as his sister Kathleen said to me, it kind of put him in suspended animation for that time. And he comes out and he is more immersed in the changes of the 1960s than he would have been if he had just kind of gone straight into his career, you know, and was uh, was further along in his career. Instead, he got involved, uh, you know, with voting rights in the South. Uh, he he was uh, active in organizing an anti-war slate in the 68 uh, to the 68 Democratic Convention, while his father, the former governor, was all, still all the way with LBJ. Um, and he, he uh, uh, you know, did some work with Cesar Chavez. And when he runs for office in 1974, I believe he, maybe along with Gary Hart running for Senate that same year in, in, in Colorado, is the first mainstream politician to begin to road test what of the ideas that emerged in the 1960s could be uh, 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 sold to a majority audience when you had to win uh, an election. And so ideas like environmentalism, uh, more inclusion of minorities and women in appointments, support for the farm workers, uh, movement, age of limits. Jerry Brown in 74, the same time these, these ideas are triumphing in popular culture is really, I think, at the point of the spear in testing what you know what versions of them could be uh, sellable in a political uh, context, and I and I talk about I, you know the 1974 Democratic gubernatorial primary. Not to get into uh, too far here, was like a long episode of All in the Family with with uh, Joe Alioto and Bob Moretti as Archie Bunker, utterly mystified and completely incomprehensible of what younger Jerry slash Rob Reiner was talking about, uh, and it, it had that kind of generational feel. Hayden and Fonda really are kind of the same question posed in an even more pointed way. And, and in some ways, I, I feel like this is one of my most um, uh, kind of uh, intimate and, and revealing chapters of the book, because I go into great length about their relationship and their story. I kind of pick up Tom Hayden, for those of you who saw the trial of the Chicago Seven, I kind of pick him up on the next day. Um, and he goes to Berkeley eventually to kind of lick his wounds, starts a commune that includes our uh, old colleague, Robert Shear and Shear's ex-wife, um, and ultimately is kicked out of the commune because he's too much of a male chauvinist pig on the one hand and someone who doesn't really like, you know, even though he wanted to have a collective, he didn't really want to listen to anybody else. So his life is just in utter ruins. He crumples into his Volkswagen and he drives down to LA and he washes up like a piece of driftwood on the beach in Venice, which is not the Venice that I am living in today. It's like kind of the Venice uh, of outpatients and uh, you know drug addicts. By the way, our former colleague who you probably knew that I didn't, Dave Smith, wrote some unbelievable pieces about Venice in the early night. They're, they're beautiful. They hold up 50 years later. But Hayden is kind of really at low ebb. Meanwhile, Jane Fonda is just kind of spiraling out of control. Um, and becoming more and more alienated from American society, and in some ways less and less relevant to the causes. And American society returned the favor. The death her. of Jane Fonda. You yeah. can still see faded bumper stickers on still. cards from the 70s. Today. I'm not Fonda Hanoi Jane. Um, and I tell the story of how they, they both kind of uh, provided a, a break you know, a circuit breaker for the other. And how in this early 1970s period, again, culminating in 1974, they make a fundamental decision. They change direction from spiraling toward greater alienation toward finding a way to work within the political system. Um, and it obviously leads to her kind of revival of her career and, and becoming an exercise maven and his uh, entering elected politics. And in some ways, you know, is symbolic of the change of the generation. The left side of the baby boom, the people who participated in the social movements of the 1960s, um, they didn't simply fold up their tent when the fundamental change that they expected or hoped for never materialized. They found new ways to be relevant in their communities and their families and their careers. I talk about this a lot with Jackson Brown in the book. And, and Jackson Brown has songs on each of his first three albums that somewhat track the progression of the Hayden Fonda slash Jerry Brown experience. And so I, I try to tell how this same current, uh, you know, this question of what from the 60s can be made relevant in the 70s and how uh, infuses pop culture and politics at the same time and ultimately produces a kind of a way that we live, you know, that the way that we live did change. I mean, we didn't get big, you know, structural revolution in America, but women didn't go back in the kitchen 
after you know the 60s and 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 groups that had been marginalized did not go back to just quietly accepting second class uh, status and people did not re revert to the trust in government and business that was there these changes were real they lasted and they were brought to the mass audience by the pop culture produced mostly in LA in the early 1970s you use the word paradox and you set up paradoxes a lot in the book. And when I'm thinking of television and film, with film, as, as you cited, we had the younger generation of yeah. filmmakers, which didn't seem to be radical. The older generation had, had lived lives. The younger generation watched movies and that was yeah. their frame of reference. And they seemed to be almost going out of their way in some cases not to engage with politics yeah. or with cultural turmoil. Yes, so that, that is one of the great ironies that in many ways, the critique of American life that emerged from the 60s movements, the 60s movements that were largely driven by the liberal side of the baby boom, uh, it was brought to the screen primarily by an older generation of writers and directors. I mean, whether we're talking about uh, on TV with Norman Lear and Larry Gelbart, uh, who was, who was you know, the, the, the genius behind MASH, uh, or certainly in movies, Arthur Penn, Robert Altman, Roman Polanski, Bob Rafelson, Mike Nichols, uh, not to mention Beatty and, um, and Nicholson, and even Fonda, who, all of whom were born uh, in, in the 30s. When the younger generation, and, and these were the ones, these are the people who had toiled through the kind of deadening, you know, drowsy Tuesday afternoon of the 1960s in Hollywood, where the where the hangover from the blacklist era was still very strong, and there was really no ability to say much of anything. And suddenly, the cultural wheel turned enough that people like Arthur Penn and Robert Altman and and uh, Alan Pakula, you know, found that they were able to tell the stories they wanted to tell. And what they mostly wanted to tell were stories that tore down the myths that Hollywood had created. I mean, that was, it was an act of sustained demolition, particularly in the case of Robert Altman. When the baby boomers come along, the directors born in the 40s, so we're talking about Spielberg and Scorsese and Lucas and Paul Schrader and Brian De Palma. Um, when they come along, um, they're not as interested in doing that. I mean, there's Taxi Driver from Scorsese and Schrader, which might have belonged, which does kind of fit in with what we saw from the earlier generation. But by and large, uh, it was George Lucas with American Graffiti in 1973, which was set precisely right before all the changes of the 60s, who kind of gave away the, the, the new direction. He went back to his hometown, uh, right, uh, you know, right when American Graffiti came out in 19 Modesto? Yeah, Modesto, and gave a speech to the assembled Rotarians of Modesto. And he said, I got tired of going to movies where everybody felt worse coming out of the theater than when they went in, right? I wanted, I wanted a story that would make people feel better. And, and you know, that by, you know, uh, later there was more kind of social awareness in the Spielberg work, um, but by and large, that was more the rallying cry of the baby boom directors. They wanted to return to Hollywood, they wanted to point toward Hollywood's future by returning to its roots of just kind of gripping entertainment and, you know, valorous heroes and dastardly villains. And, you know, uh, it was, they were, they were great filmmakers, but they, that was their mission. They kind of, they kind of felt that the earlier generation had done enough of the, the deconstruction, uh, Spielberg said something about, uh, you know, in this period about how he didn't want to be the, the spokesman for the paranoid 70s. I'm not that paranoid. Look at his first two movies. The hero in each case is an everyman cop. And that would not have been, you know, that's a long way from Bonnie and Clyde. And the same thing happened to some extent in television, as you point out, where after the, the, the surge of the Norman Lear genre, if we can call it that, television started going back to yeah. the anodyne and, and the silly, as you say, it's, it's Three's Company, it's, uh, it's shows like that. And, and in, in fact, to do that, I'll, I'll bring in a question from Jane, one of the people watching yeah. saying, okay, yes, you had those kinds of mindless television moments where, as you point out, Ron, nobody wanted to relitigate the, the, the 60s in prime time, but you also had shows like Roots and yes. the Holocaust that move people forward, that pull people forward yeah. in a way. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, it, 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 um, you know, cult, the 
culture never moves entirely. The current never flows entirely uh, in one direction at any one time. There's always kind of eddies. Uh, and you're right. I mean, Roots was a landmark um, uh, in, in the mid 70s. But the other landmark was Happy Days replacing All in the Family as the number one show on TV in 1976 after All in the Family had been number one uh, for five consecutive years. And it reflected this belief uh, that ABC even had a, a kind of consumer research memo that said people were just tired of, in, in essence, being locked in that room with Archie and Mike refighting everything they had fought in their own living rooms over the previous decades, a uh, decade with, uh, with you know, uh, parents uh, and kids. And, and there was a shift. I mean, there was, there was clearly, uh, and you know, in some ways it, it took the new license that was granted by the 60s uh, and the early 70s and applied it in kind of a mindless way. So, uh, you know, Three's company is not necessarily a return to Green Acres because it has a lot more titillation and sexual innuendo and, uh, you know, kind of sexual content. And, and uh, that is kind of in some ways what happens in Hollywood, which is that you, you, people take the new freedom that that emerged in this early 70s pop culture, but then kind of directed it away from the uh, the social commentary that was bound to it. Uh, you know, I mean, carnal knowledge had a lot of sex in it, but it also had a lot of commentary about how men and women uh, interacted. I'm not sure Three's Company really aspired to that, um, uh, you know, much less Charlie's Angels. Um, and so that, that was kind of one of the ironies about the pop culture of the, of the later 70s and early 80s was it accepted the new freedoms um, that, uh, that Norman Lear and all of these directors had won so, so grudgingly, but it kind of abandoned their desire to comment on the society around them with that new freedom. Let's uh, ask our audience for some questions for Ron Brownstein, but, but my question before we get to theirs, yeah. Ron, is what, what ended this all? What pulled the plug and brought this, this structure, this very glamorous but fragile structure down on itself? You know, there are a couple things. I mean, there was the there was the rot from within. I mean, there was the the spread of cocaine in in the in the mid seventies uh, that really paid paid a price in L.A. There was that kind of gathering cloud of decadence that you get uh, on, in Hotel California uh, in seventy six of the Eagles. Ultimately, the arrest of Polanski for having sex with a I think thirteen year old girl. And Angelica Houston said to me like. That, you know, him doing that didn't seem that out of character to what a lot of other people were doing. I mean, it, it, there was this kind of cloud of decadence that, that, that settled over the scene. There was also the first stirrings of the backlash of what became the religious right against these um, uh, increased open expression, particularly on television. Maude has an abortion uh, in, uh, in a two-part episode, and there's a huge... Uh, backlash against that, but I think the biggest thing was 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 that uh, was the shift in the audience. I mean, when it became clear that we were not going to have uh, kind of fundament the fundamental social change that that um, uh, at times the '60s uh, beckoned toward, um, uh, the willingness of the audience to just kind of relitigate those arguments uh, diminished. But as we were saying a moment ago, you know, it wasn't like we reverted to the same place after the willingness to relitigate those arguments uh, uh, kind of evaporated. We started at a new baseline. I think the ideas that were that emerged and, and, and kind of transitioned from the social movements of the 60s into pop culture in the early 1970s really became lasting ideas to the point where we can't really even remember the world before them, before there was greater distrust of authority in business and government, before there was greater autonomy for women, all the changes in attitudes about relations between men and women, about family and sex, uh, and about the role and the, and, and the rights of, of, of excluded groups. Uh, you know, we didn't transform the society completely, but the society did change and by the time this tide rolls back of socially aware filmmaking, it has left an imprint on the beach. I mean, the beach looks different. Uh, and the way we live, I think, followed uh, those changes in pop culture uh, and remains so to this day. I mean, that really is the story. I mean, you know, the culture war never ends in America, but that doesn't mean it's static. We, 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 we kind of have an argument, we establish a new baseline, and then we start arguing from that baseline. Well, and that's certainly where we are even today. And, and, and this goes to a question that Phyllis posed about the arts and cultural climate having an impact on politics. You and I both remember the Dan Quayle, Murphy Brown thing, oh. where Dan Quayle denounced a television character for having a child out of wedlock. So clearly there's still a reach, but sometimes it, 
it motivates it forward. And sometimes the, the politics says, uh, 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 you shall not pass to the culture. That, okay, so that's a really interesting uh, point because I think that politics and culture usually act out of phase. Um, the, the electorate, and here's why, the electorate is older and whiter than the country overall. It always has been, it probably always will be in terms, just because in terms of turnout rates, uh, who votes. So the electorate is older and whiter. And that means that at any given moment, uh, it is certainly possible, Nixon showed it, Reagan showed it, Trump in his own way showed it. Um, it is possible to mobilize a winning coalition of voters uh, around the idea of opposing the way the society is changing, right? I mean, Nixon's silent majority won him two national elections uh, precisely at the same time these ideas were embedding themselves uh, in popular culture. And certainly Trump, uh, he didn't win a majority, but he won a, uh, you know, an electoral college victory in 2016 um, by essentially telling his audience of predominantly non-college, non-urban and uh, evangelical whites that he would stop all of the changes uh, that they felt were marginalizing them in American life. So at any given moment, you can win an election by promising to stop the changes. I think what you can't do is actually stop the changes. I think that is the big lesson of the early 1970s, that when there is a moment of generational transition, that it, because the entertainment industries have to be more attuned to younger audience than the politicians do because of the reason I just cited uh, in terms of what the electorate looked like versus what the society looks like, the changes are more likely to be reflected in popular culture first. I think that's the clear message of the early 1970s. And I think it's true again today. I mean, I think if you look at the, at the message of inclusion that radiates through the pop culture um, uh, that most rivets younger generations today, that gives you a better idea of how we are going to be living in 10 years than looking at Trump's uh, success in various uh, elections. Doesn't mean the left is always going to win elections. But it does mean that the kind of vision of what America looks like that younger generations are expressing in pop culture today is probably going to be a pretty good preview of how we are actually going to be living our day to day lives in the 2030s. Now, Florence has a question, and then I'll append mine out of her. She wants to know whether there's anything comparable to what you describe in the 70s having that kind of impact today. And my caveat is that the media landscape is now so fractured. The corollary is whether anything like that is even possible today. Right, right. There, there, there's nothing, there's no single focal point for the, you know, in the way it's very hard for anything to become a culture, cultural touchstone of the magnitude of All in the Family or MASH, uh, but even of some of the movies that we're, you know, that we're talking about, Godfather 1, Godfather 2. Um, I don't think that's possible. But I do think, as I said, that there is a significant parallel. Uh, Gen Z and the millennials are the biggest combined the biggest generation uh, since the baby boom. In fact, I think combined, they are now a bigger share of the population than the baby boom ever was. Uh, a majority of the country has been born since 1981. And that includes the generation of 2014 and beyond, which I don't think we've named yet. Each of these generations is the most diverse in American history. The millennials were, Gen Z is more diverse than them, and whatever we're going to call this post-2014 generation, it will be the first in American history that will be majority people of color. Um, and you can see the way in which they are beginning to imprint their experiences and values onto popular culture. I mean, look at the Grammys any, any year and look at that stage and who's up there uh, performing or even I, you know, I would say even the Academy Awards this year, I mean, just the, I think you had a bigger concentration of socially aware and certainly diverse films than we'd seen at almost any point since the 1970s. And I think this is just irreversible. I mean, you know, um, it, it, these, these are the generations that are going to be running things in 10 or 12 years. And their perspective ultimately will be our perspective. I, you know, it, it's funny, you, you, um, you, you know, we, the, we, we mentioned there's gonna be a, an event soon about cancel culture and wokeness. I, I find that debate just kind of odd because ultimately younger generations are gonna decide how they're gonna be addressed in society and in the workplace. And the future always gets the last word. I mean, th th there's only one way for this argument to go. Um, when you have a big moment of generational change. And so younger generations get to decide kind of how they live their daily lives. And you can win elections by saying you'll stop it. What you can't actually do is stop it. You can ask your question of Ron Bronstein. If you put it in the Q&A box, we'll try to get to it. Um, Ron, Carol wants to know whether, and you do spend some time on this in your book, whether Motown had any kind of similar yeah. impact. 
Well, you know, Motown came out here. Barry Gordy moved Motown out to um, uh, LA, uh, but he kept it very much separate from everything else that was happening in LA. You know, I mean, the great writer, uh, producer, executive Lou Adler, who had lived with Sam Cooke and written songs with him, co-wrote uh, Wonderful World. Um, he, he, I was interviewing him and we were talking about Motown and he he, you know, he, he produced Tapestry and he would, and he created, uh, uh, he was one of the co-founders of the Roxy on Sunset. Uh, so it was right in the center uh, of everything. Good buddies with, with Jack Nicholson. And we were talking about Motown and he kind of gestured with his arm, like they were over there, you know, they built their own studio. They had their own choreographers. They had their own arrangers. They had their own session musicians. They kind of kept themselves separate. And yet, even amid that, um, they produced what may have been the greatest singer songwriter um, uh, album of the protest era, Marvin Gaye, what's going on. It is noteworthy that Barry Gordy didn't want Marvin Gaye to make what's going on and that Marvin Gaye stayed in Detroit in order to do so, coming out here only to do the final mixing on it as I, as I recall. So Motown was a mountain, but it was kind of its own mountain and, and kept its distance. And of course, Gordy really resisted um, kind of social messaging in that music, even though several of the artists, a ball of confusion and so forth, uh, kind of uh, uh, pulled in that direction eventually. But certainly what's going on is an absolute high point of kind of the singer songwriter era. Uh, and I, as I said, it was striking that it was produced back in Detroit, away from kind of the corporate control of Motown that it resettled in LA by that point. Our audience knows Judy Davidson, whose husband, Gordon Davidson, in the early 70s was the creative director. I'm sure that's not his title, but at, at the, uh, the theaters of, at the Music Center. And he did plays about Vietnam, about mm. the destruction of the Amazon zoot suit, Catonsville 9. Yeah. Was, was theater, in a way, able to be bolder? Was it? Did you assess the role of theater in? I didn't, I didn't really, I did not really look at theater or for that matter, the art world, which was really, you know, bursting in LA at that point as well. Um, uh, because my focus ended up, and 400 pages later was probably enough, my focus ended up being on the pop culture that was being exported from LA to a national audience. I mean, that's really what I was, I was writing about rather than what was intrinsic to LA for the LA audience. But you know, you talk, I, I remember talking to Michael Ovitz, uh, who later became the most powerful person in Hollywood for you know the 80s and early 90s, and at that point was a young TV agent. And he, like many, were talking about how this seemed to be infusing everything, including theater, including modern art. I mean, Irving Azoff, who was the manager of the Eagles and later, you know, the head of like everything, uh, various this and that. I mean, he, he said everything in L.A. seemed to be magical, you know, from Hollywood to Malibu, from the clubs uh, to the, you know, to the bars, to the, to the concert halls. And, and there was, you know, there was a powerful current. And, and I, I think, you know, you haven't asked me uh, or we haven't discussed a question that often gets asked, like, why LA? Like, why not New York at that moment? Um, uh, New York. You know, and in fact, I was growing up in New York at that point, and this was a pretty low ebb for New York. This was the era of Ford to New York drop dead. Drop it, was dead. Pregnancy, it was urban decay. It was crime. Uh, it, and, and, you know, New York achieved, re restored its cultural primacy when all of that became relevant, really, in the mid-70s. Um, but the, the word that people used to describe LA the most in the early 70s in all of these industries was open. Ultimately, it was open. It was open to new ideas. It was open to new people. Uh, it seemed like the, the barriers to entry uh, were coming down. People were kind of, Jackson Brown talked about how not only the artists would get together, Graham Nash talked to me about that, but even the artists and the producers and the executives, and it all be kind of sharing ideas and probably illicit substances and kind of, fer you know, kind of this ferment. I mean, he told me the story about hearing Glenn Fry. Uh, his neighbor, uh, you know, obviously co-founder of the Eagles, play Sweet Little 16 on the acoustic guitar and saying, wait, you can do that? You know, and that was happening in movies as well. I mean, the equivalent was happening uh, on TV where Gelbart and James L. Brooks and Norman Lear all felt this kind of friendly competition. So I think LA in that sense just had this amazing sense of openness. And Joan Tewksbury, who wrote um, Nashville, emailed me after the book came out and said, what you really captured was this sense I felt at the time that we were all riding this wave, that it was all kind of getting bigger, 
Um, and, and Pat, I mean, you might appreciate this. I find that really different than the writing about LA in the late 60s. I mean, if you look at most of the writing about LA in the late 60s, Joan Didion being you know, perhaps the paradigmatic example, the writing is about how the seams are coming out, how it's kind of pulling apart. And Manson seems almost the inevitable endpoint of the way people were describing life in LA in the late 60s. And I feel by the time I check in in my story, it's the opposite. It's things are coming together, they're coalescing, they're cresting, and there is just this wave of creative achievement. Before I get to your summary, I do want to ask you about the enormous range of interviews that you did for this yeah. book. I mean, some truly amazing uh, people, you know, seminal people in all of the fields that you talk about. Was it very hard or, or was it pretty easy to get them to talk? And were they surprised when you presented your thesis to them? It it was it took time, right? When you're interviewing celebrities and they don't have a project to sell, it rarely happens overnight. I mean, it's often 18 months. <laughs> you're glad you're writing a book because it can take a year. Some people talk to me right away. I mean, Graham Nash uh, was one of the first. Um, and each person who talks to you validates you for someone else. But yes, I interviewed 125 people. I mean, I interviewed Warren Beatty and Jane Fonda and Linda Ronstadt and Jackson Brown uh, and, and Graham Nash and Lou Adler and Irving Azoff and Angelica Houston and uh, many of the political figures of the time. I will tell you one interesting observation after interviewing 100 and, and once I talked to them, they were very happy to talk about this period. I think because people recognized within their own silo that something special was going on by and large. I think people in music, in television, in movies all recognized that they were doing something new and doing something different. And man, this was fun. Um, Beatty and Town, Robert Town, both used almost exactly those words. It was like, it was like that, you know, you would be given more colors in, in, in your your crayon box. You know, you, you could write about and do movies about things that you couldn't do before. You could tell stories you couldn't tell before. But I will say, having interviewed all of these people, I did find a difference, which is that when you interview men about kind of critical moments in their career, they tend to be brave Ulysses telling you stories about how they went forth and conquered. I mean, that's mostly what you get when you interview men. A lot of the women are more anthropologists or, or sociologists. I mean, Linda Ronstadt and Angelica Houston, Jane Fonda, they were all incredibly perceptive uh, about kind of the group dynamics and everyone else and how everyone interacted and how it, how it evolved. There were very few guys, uh, Jackson Brown, not maybe not surprisingly, was one of them, who, who kind of saw things in that way. They more, they more told you the stories of their triumphs and failures, their, their battles, uh, whereas the women, we're really more kind of outward focused on the group itself. Uh, so we'll, we'll wrap up and let you have the last word with, with just your sense of even beyond the pages and, and the, the calendar borders of the book as to what kind of imprint this period, this magical year of magical doing in Los Angeles really has had on us today so many decades later. Yeah, so, you know, there is a tendency, obviously, to, to, to dismiss LA. Um, and so there will be a lot of people who kind of go, huh, at what I'm about to say. But I think if you look at the collection of talent that gathered in LA in the early 1970s in movies, music, and television, it holds up against any other a period considered a golden age anywhere in, in the 20th century, whether it's the literary world in Paris in the 1920s or the modern art world uh, in New York in the 1950s. When you got Larry Gelbart, James L. Brooks, and Norman Lear on the same night, at the same time that you have Joni Mitchell, Jackson Brown, Linda Ronstadt, the Eagles, uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash, uh, uh, and Arthur Penn, and Steven Spielberg, and um, uh, you know Bob Rafelson and George Lucas and Beatty and Nicholson all producing work at the very top of their powers. That is just an incredible constellation of talent in one place at one time. And it is more than just kind of a firework. It's also kind of a hinge in America's social and political history because this is the moment. And this is the place primarily where the key pillars of the 60s critique of American life entered pop culture, never to be dislodged, changed the way that we lived our daily lives in real and material ways. And uh, the ideas that I mentioned, greater suspicion of authority in business and government, greater autonomy for women, greater inclusion of marginalized groups, new attitudes about marriage and sex, they are all so much of a part of our mental architecture that we cannot imagine there was a time before them. 
But if you go back to the pop culture of the 1960s, there was a time before them. And I think it is the lasting legacy of these great artists that I write about with that they produced the, the, the works that kind of led us out of that world and began, I think, the, you know, the transition into the world that we live in today. Ron, thank you. Ron Brownstein, my old colleague from the LA Times, and his new book, Rock Me on the Water, 1974, the year Los Angeles transformed movies, music, television, and politics. It's a wonderful thing to read, and you'll recognize a lot of Los Angeles and maybe even yourself in it. Ron, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much for doing this. Thanks, everybody, for watching. And now, as we said, as you heard Janice and David talk about, we're going to be joined by Ambassador Dennis Ross to talk about what's going on in Israel right now. He has worked for the Carter, Reagan, Bush Sr., Clinton, and Obama administrations, an expert on Soviet and Middle Eastern policy. He spearheaded various Mideast peace negotiations, many of which led to peace treaties and important alliances. He currently serves as counselor and fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and the author of many books, including um, one entitled Be Strong and of Good Courage, How Israel's Most Important Leaders Shaped Its Destiny. Mr. Ambassador, thank you for being here on such short notice to this evening when so many people wanna know just what's going on in that part of the world. Truly appreciate your being here. See if we can get you unmuted here, Ambassador. Yes, there there you go. Go. Okay. now I'm unmuted, so good. Thank, Thank you, you very much. So, so I, I guess we, we should start by, because this has snowballed so quickly, by getting a sense of what was the trigger to the, this worst period in maybe decades in Israel and why it accelerated so quickly. You know, I think the, the best way to describe this is that it's been a, a perfect storm. What do I mean by that? You've had a confluence of a number of circumstances, any one of which by itself might have been a problem, but taken together, they became combustible. So what's a series of things? We had a Mahmoud Abbas call for an election, 93% of Palestinians registered for the election, suggesting how enthusiastic they were to have the first election since 2006, and then he chose to cancel it. Why did he choose to cancel it? Because he understood the odds were that Fatah, uh, his party was split with three different lists. Hamas was once again gonna run a discipline list of one list. Uh, and he could see what the writing on the wall was, it was gonna produce what happened before Hamas was gonna win. When he cancels it, it creates enormous frustration and Hamas has an incentive to see how to take advantage of it. So that's number one. Number two, you have Ramadan taking place and in the context of Ramadan taking place, there is a decision that's going to be brought to the Israeli Supreme Court after the, the district court finds that there is a small group of Palestinian families who live in Sheikh Jarrah, which is a one of the neighborhoods close to the old city, just outside the walls. Uh, I would say 95% Arab, about 5% Jewish. Uh, and this decision of uh, basically forcing them to be expelled, evicted, becomes a cause celeb in part because it's taking place in Ramadan. Then you have Jerusalem Day. Jerusalem Day is taking place near the end of Ramadan. The last days of Ramadan become devout days. Tens of thousands go to the Haram al-Sharif, the Temple Mount, to the al Aska Mosque to pray. Uh, and the same day as that, you have Jerusalem Day, which commemorates the victory in 1967, which reunifies uh, Jerusalem. And there's a march through the old city, typically dominated by ultranationalists. So here's a, a combination of circumstances that come together and they give a particular religious flavor to this and a Jerusalem flavor to it. The one issue that is more emotive because it's the source of identity for Israelis and Palestinians alike, the one issue that is a narrative issue that goes to the heart of self-definition is Jerusalem. And when you touch the religious side of Jerusalem, this is electric. This is a mobilizing um, element always. And Hamas saw this as a moment where it could change the ground rules, where it could seize the mantle of control of the Palestinian movement trying to take it away from Fatah, the PLO, the Palestinian Authority, uh, 
they saw they could present themselves as the protectors of Jerusalem, who countering the Israelis in Jerusalem. Uh, and the fact that on the on Jerusalem Day, you had the Israeli police end up shooting tear gas into the Alaska Mosque. Why? And this is always a last resort thing because stones are being thrown into the Kotel from the surface. You know, the, you have the, the surface where the two mosques are, and then you have the Kotel on the other side, uh, down below, people in front of the, the Western Wall, tens of thousands of Israelis there. You get hit by a stone uh, from a couple hundred feet above, it can be fatal. So the police react to that, and they, they push people back, and they end up shooting uh, tear gas canisters uh, into the, into the uh, Oscar Mosque, and then it becomes a question of who's defending the Oscar Mosque. So all these things come together. The Hamas decides they're going to change the ground rules by declaring, and they literally, Mohammed Daif, who was the, the bomb maker from the 1990s, the head of the Yazidi Al Qassam Brigades, the military wings of Hamas, declares if the Israelis don't desist what they're doing in Jerusalem, then Hamas will make them pay. And sure enough, uh, they then launch seven rockets uh, towards Jerusalem. I want you to think about that for a second. There are 368,000 Palestinians who live in East Jerusalem. So when you shoot rockets at Jerusalem, the chances of killing somebody, the chances are almost just as good of killing Palestinians as they are of Israelis. This was not about protecting Palestinians. This was about making a statement that we're going to affect what the Israelis do when they take these kinds of acts within Jerusalem. Uh, and we'll seize the mantle. And for Israel, there's a need in the face of this to say, you cross the red line. Uh, we have to reestablish deterrence. You have to understand the high cost of what you've just done. That's what has got us off to the races now in terms of what's going on uh, between Gaza uh, and Israel, basically with Hamas firing 600 rockets into Israel yesterday. Uh, the number is greatly down today. It's around 200 today. Whether that's because of a conscious decision or because the Israelis have been uh, somewhat more effective in terms of their strikes or because Egypt is putting some pressure on them, too soon to know. But the day has been quiet around Tel Aviv, not quiet around the southern part of Israel. It sounds as if this has presented an opportunity, which sounds like an ugly word under the circumstances, for every faction to try to take an advantage. And so one of the questions I think which needs to be asked is qui bono? Who benefits from this? What, what advantage can Netanyahu take from this? You mentioned uh, the failure to form a coalition. What advantage can Hamas take from this? Is that, are there 300% of people trying to get at 100% of whatever's going on? Well, there is one person who is clearly gonna benefit politically, not because it, it helps him politically, but because it makes it almost impossible to form an alternative government that was very close to being formed. What has happened now, because we're also seeing one thing I didn't mention, we are seeing the worst outbreak of riots and violence in Israel in the mixed Arab Israeli towns. Every, literally every place where there is a mixed population, there have been riots, cars torched, uh, at least one fatality. We're talking about Jaffa, we're talking about Lod, we're talking about Ramli, we're talking about uh, Haifa. So this appears to reflect uh, a small percentage of, of younger uh, Israeli Arabs who, have a, who are radicalized. They're clearly a small minority, but if you have a million, uh, if you have a million Israeli Arabs and the vast majority of them have been emphasizing their desire to be integrated, that's what Mansour Abbas of the Ram party was was focused on, and there were negotiations that Bibi had begun with, with him that both Bennett and Lapid had been pursuing, and they were pretty close to an understanding. Now, given what's happening with the Israeli Arabs, this becomes very problematic. By the way, a lot of the violence that comes from some from what are these younger Israeli Arabs who are radicalized, but also there's Lahava, which is an ultra right wing group of Israelis who have been going into these towns and basically pursuing trouble. Uh, so the clashes, it's on both sides. You can't see just one, but it is, is on both sides. What it has done is it's made it impossible to form an alternative government right now because the Arabs now feel they can't be a part of such a government at this stage. Uh, and it's very difficult for this 
what's known as the, the pro-change uh, coalition, it's very difficult for them to reach out to the Arabs in this environment. Now the clock for the for Lapid who was given the mandate, the clock's ticking. Uh, so, so long as the conflict with Hamas is going on, it's gonna be, you basically, this mandate will run out. And I'll just make one last point, which relates to the question you're asking. Hamas likes this too, because the last thing Hamas wants is to see coexistence within Israel between Arabs and Jews. That's the last thing they want. So the more you see this turmoil, the more they help to trigger it, the better it is from their standpoint. So Prime Minister Netanyahu is not going to be able to form a government because he already lost his mandate, but he will. We're more likely now to face, face a fifth election. Uh, and that certainly was his position once it became clear he couldn't form a government. So Hamas is gaining in the near term, but I'm not so sure they, they truly gain over time because once again, they've demonstrated the well-being of the Palestinians they preside over in Gaza is their last concern, not their first concern. So uh, Hamas has seen an advantage in, in, in exploiting some of this, but what was in it for Hamas to launch a rocket attack when there, there seemed to be a, a, a wash in terms of an advantage? to this, uh, this strategy, if it's a strategy at all? I think what they're trying to do is to signal they are active in terms of representing the Palestinian cause and resisting the Israelis at a time when there are steps that Palestinians see as unacceptable uh, and as an imposition and as the worst form of imposition on Palestinians. And they don't see Abu Mazen, Mahmoud Abbas, doing anything. Now, there is an irony here. The irony is that, as I said, Jerusalem's the one thing that being, brings people out of the streets. Every time we've seen big demonstrations uh, outside of the Second Intifada, uh, it was always connected to some event in the old city, connected to the religious sites that provoked it. Uh, so Hamas is putting himself on the side, we'll stand up. And you know, the concept of resistance is very much a part of the Palestinian narrative. Abu Mazen will emphasize resistance, but nonviolent resistance. Hamas emphasizes resistance as part of the coda. So they see themselves gaining at Abu Mazen's expense. The question you're asking is, well, is it anything except temporary? I mean, after all, you have Palestinians in Gaza are going to be the ones who pay the price right now. You, you launch 600 rockets into Israel, none of, not one of which is guided not one of which targets a military site, every single one of which is basically a terror weapon going at, at cities. Uh, and there's gonna be a heavy response from the Israelis into Gaza. And even if the Israelis, they, you know, they'll warn the population to leave buildings before they attack them, uh, you're still, there's no way you fight an antiseptic war. You, you're gonna get people who are killed and it's gonna be the, the Palestinians who live in Gaza who pay the price one thing about Hamas, they have tunnels not to protect people, but to protect their weapons and their fighters. Where do the, the leaders of Hamas go? Typically where they go, especially in the conflict areas, they, they operate their command control centers out of the basement of the Sheba hospital. Mm -hmm. so they pick sites that make it difficult for the Israelis to attack. Uh, some sites the Israelis will attack anyway, because if they don't attack them, then they, you know, they have an, a, an inability to try to preempt or disrupt the ability to launch rockets against them. And yet there's always the question with any war, who takes the moral high ground and what advantage do you lose if, if you do? Look, there is a, this is always, this is a dilemma, first of all, for any state that fights a non-state act, non actor. Uh, this is a dilemma for any conventional military that is taking on a force that embeds itself in populated areas by design. They see it making themselves less vulnerable. They see themselves winning. If the Israelis, in this case, kill Palestinian civilians as they prosecute the effort to try to raise the price to Hamas to get them to stop the war, they lose in the, in the world of in, this, in the world of public opinion. Uh, if they don't do it then they lose because Hamas is able to fire more rockets off at them. Hamas probably has 50,000 rockets. Where do they put the, the money they've had? People talk about what's going on within Gaza because of the kind of what the, 
the embargo that Israel has on it. Uh, well, one thing that's clear, the money that comes in, they clearly divert a portion of it exclusively for military purposes. This is really the first big foreign policy international crisis for the Biden administration. What do you think is going on right now in the White House and in the State Department assessing what to do? It's an excellent question because as you know, President Biden has wanted to shift our priority away from the Middle East. He's wanted to keep the, the focus on the Indo-Pacific region. He wants to focus on competition with China and restoring our alliances. So here we have a kind of reminder that you may not want to focus on the Middle East, but the Middle East isn't going to leave you alone. Uh, and so here is a reminder that, that even if you want to commit less in the Middle East, you probably have to have a visible enough level of diplomacy to manage it so you minimize the potential for these kinds of eruptions. So I think what they're wrestling with right now is what's the level of what we should be doing? Who is it we should be working with? To give you one example, uh, Egypt has brokered the last four ceasefires between Israel and Hamas over going back to the year 2012. So they've been pivotal in that. There has been, I, 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 this is not an exaggeration to say, President Sisi hasn't been called by President Biden. That's just an observation. You can assume that Egypt would like very much for the United States to be paying more attention to it, to realize there's a value in the relationship. Here's a reminder that you have dilemmas and tensions and objectives with a lot of your relationships. Here's a reminder that if we wanna bring this to an end, we're gonna need Egypt to play the central role in terms of brokering it because they can deal directly with the Israelis and with Hamas. And they have leverage on Hamas because when I said there, Israel has an embargo uh, on Hamas in Gaza, Gaza has two borders, it has three borders. It has a border to Israel, it has a border with the sea and it has a border with Egypt. So Egypt has the capacity to ease the pressure by opening their borders. They can open their borders, they can close their borders. And in fact, they modulate what they permit through the border. And that gives them the ability to be dealing with Hamas, which as I said, they have brokered the last four ceasefires. So here the administration, I think, is gonna to have to deal with Egypt. I'm gonna to have to show they understand the value of Egypt's role in this regard. Uh, and that requires some adjustment probably in terms of thinking about how we're approaching uh, some of the, the partners we've had traditionally in the Middle East. All of the players in this have to start recalibrating. So you've got the UAE, you've got Bahrain, you've got Sudan, you've got Morocco, you've got Egypt. It's almost like a game board where everyone has to reset their positions as a consequence of this, or is it that serious? Yeah, I, think it, I think it's too soon to know. In the immediate, in the sense of immediacy that we have right now, it certainly looks like it's not only urgent, but that it will have, it could have far reaching effects. I'm not sure that's the case. What we've seen is that the, the Emirates actually hosted an Arab League meeting where they and others made a tough statement on Israel's, what Israel was doing in Jerusalem. But if, if you look at it, in a sense, what the Emirates are doing is what Egypt and Jordan have done over the years since they've done their peace treaties with Israel. When Israel does something that, we're, that requires from their standpoint criticism of Israel, they'll do it, but they, they never shake the treaty itself. In the case of the Emirates, what's more interesting is this is not the cold peace that Egypt and Jordan represent. It's a warm peace. Uh, they're extremely anxious to be doing business with Israel. They see themselves, they see Israel as a startup nation and them as a scale-up nation. They see these are the two nations that are the most economically advanced in the Middle East. My guess is they will try to manage that. But the fact that they felt the need to make this statement, to host an Arab League meeting, to make the statement is an indication they also had to show when it comes to Jerusalem, they also uh, have to demonstrate their fealty to it. Uh, and they repeated some of the more traditional political slogans as to what it takes to resolve the conflict. So I think we're seeing a reminder that when there is this kind of an eruption, those states that are at peace are put in a more difficult position. It doesn't mean they walk away, because we've seen that, but it does mean they're put somewhat more on the defensive uh, and how they manage the relationship may be affected at least in the near term. Uh, the, the readiness of others to follow suit is likely to be affected by this. And I would say it's a reminder for everyone, as significant as the Abraham Accords are and were, and I can offer you more on that, 
because I still think they do provide a, a vehicle for us to do something on the Israeli-Palestinian issue. As significant as those were, we have been reminded that the Palestinian issue is still there. And I'll tell you, one senior uh, Emirati official said to me after they did the, uh, the agreement, uh, he said, look, in the end, we don't have a Palestinian problem. The Israelis have a Palestinian problem. The communities, the mixed communities in Israel, you spoke of the Israeli Arabs, and what, what does this portend going forward? Can anything ever go back to the way it was, or does this create a new level of suspicion and friction that's just got to be built into the recipe hereafter? I certainly believe it's going to have a legacy. Uh, now, I think there'll be some soul searching on both sides. It's not an accident that Mansour Abbas was negotiating uh, for what he could get in terms of infrastructure investment uh, in, the, in the Arab towns and villages. It's not an accident he was asking for a much more serious commitment to law and order within the, within the Arab areas. Uh, those needs aren't gonna go away. Uh, so there'll be some soul searching about, did this really serve Arab interests? And there'll also be some soul searching uh, in terms of these ultranationalists who basically are thugs who are going around looking for Arabs to beat up. So I think there'll be some soul searching in the aftermath, but it comes after a period where the perception of Israeli Arabs had changed pretty significantly. 20% of all the Israeli doctors are Arab. And in the height of COVID at its worst point, they were on the front lines and being most exposed. 30% uh, of all the nurses are Arab. This actually had a profound psychological effect within Israel about looking at who were the people who were putting themselves at risk during COVID. Uh, and then you saw, I mean, Netanyahu was the one who, after saying in 2015, they're coming and voting in droves and then wanting, you know, in, in two years later to have cameras in, the, in their polling places. He's the one who suddenly began reaching out uh, to the Arabs. So he, he, in effect, broke the taboo on reaching out to the Arabs in terms of government formation. The problem is the, the impact of this. It's, I have to tell you, when I talk to the Israelis, you know, who I've been talking to in the last two days, they're stunned by this. And they're, they're, they're really shocked by this. So, you know, I think there'll be some soul searching, but I think there'll also be, it's gonna, the, the friction, the legacy of this is not gonna go away overnight. Because of the opportunity that presents to destabilize and take advantage, is, does anyone read the hand of Iran in this at all? Well, they should. Uh, because one of the drivers of this out of Gaza was Islamic Jihad. Uh, Islamic Jihad is, uh, is entirely supported, financed uh, by, by Iran. Uh, so they were, certainly, uh, they were certainly pushing them. It was Islamic Jihad that was the first to come out and say what there was going to be done um, yesterday. They were the one who said, you know, we're going to hit Tel Aviv at 9 o'clock. And then, in fact, at a quarter to 9, you had a, a barrage of missile, missiles that were fired. So I do think this is part and parcel of the Iranian effort to show their ability to create pressures everywhere in the region. Uh, they've adopted a position towards us of trying to demonstrate that they can raise the cost to us unless in fact we go back not only to the JCPOA, but what is going on in the Vienna talks, the Iranians are effectively seeking more for less. They want sanctions relief that goes beyond what is our responsibility under the Iran nuclear deal, the JCPOA, and they wanna give less. I'll give you an example of what I mean when I, when I wanna give less. Uh, they were not supposed, there's certain kinds of R&D for advanced centrifuges they weren't supposed to do. Not only did they do it, they installed, they have installed four cascades of advanced centrifuges, which means you're talking about over 600 advanced centrifuges, dramatically more efficient than the ones that they have used up until now. They weren't supposed to install those before the year 2025, and even then they're supposed to limit what they could do. Now, what they're saying is, uh, in response to our position, our position is they weren't supposed to be installed, so you have to dismantle them. They say, no, we'll unplug them. Yeah, you can see they're there, but we'll unplug them. So this is, we put them four years ahead of where they were supposed to be, which already is on top of, they have acquired a level of know-how in terms of developing these systems that they would not have had until basically five years from now. So in any event, 
they don't go back exactly to where they were. And in a tangible way, they're also resisting going back to where they were, at least on this issue. Could you offer some more details about the eviction of the Palestinian families in East Jerusalem? We see the images, but we don't get much context. All right, so let me tell you what the, the story is. Sheikh Jarrah is a neighborhood that is just outside the old city, just outside the wall city. It's a close in neighborhood. Uh, when there was a very significant Jewish presence in Sheikh Jarrah prior to 1948, when the Arab Legion came in and were able to take East Jerusalem, but not West Jerusalem, the, uh, all the Jewish families obviously were forced out. Uh, properties were taken. And then there were a number of buildings that the Jordanians, then Transjordan, along with the UN, built for some of the Palestinian refugees and housed them in Sheikh Jarrah. The families that are now, uh, and, and I'll just finish that. So that was point one. Point two is that um, some of these properties clearly were Jewish properties. They were owned by a Jewish trust. There was a there's a right-wing organization that bought up some of these areas, and they then wanted to move the, the people out uh, because they said, we're now the rightful owners. Some of the owners, some of those who lived there could not provide deeds that showed they owned the property. They were taken to court. At lower levels, the courts found in favor of those who had deeds that they could show. Uh, and said that these are people who should be evicted. Now, compromises were suggested, including, by the way, uh, respecting that these were the Jewish owners, but allowing the people to stay. Those who were there rejected that compromise because the this whole issue of the eviction, and we're talking about, I think we're talking about 70 people overall, but who've lived there basically forever. I mean, at least, certainly since the post 48 period. Uh, so they, for them, this is the only home they've known. Uh, and so the Supreme Court, at the request of the Attorney General, postponed making a decision just given uh, how tense the current situation is. And I know the where do we go from here question is an over broad one, but do you see a narrower path or are there opportunities that the United States and people of goodwill can take in this? Yeah, I think we have to be realistic about where we are right now. The first thing, first things first, you got to restore calm both in Jerusalem and obviously between Israel and, and Hamas and Gaza. Um, I think we have to divide our approach into how to think about Gaza, how to think about the overall issue of trying to create circumstances where peace can be, again, a possibility. Right now, it doesn't even look like a possibility. As it relates to Gaza, I think one of the things that has to happen, the whole world has to delegitimize the idea that Hamas can fire rockets into Israel. Uh, you know, Israel withdrew from Gaza, one of the little known facts, or at least a fact that people tend to forget, when Israel withdrew in 2005, it did not slap an embargo or quarantine on Gaza. Even in the first months, the first six months after Hamas continued to carry out attacks out of Gaza into Israel after Israel had withdrawn. If your aim is to, to want the Israelis to withdraw, we ought to show that when Israel withdraws, Israel's security gains from it. They shouldn't lose their security when they withdraw. They only when Hamas took over Gaza in 2007 when they carried out a coup, literally throwing a lot of the Fatah people off the top of buildings. Uh, only in the aftermath of that did Israel then put on an embargo to limit what could go into Gaza. Uh, and so one thing that has to happen, we have a humanitarian problem in Gaza that is real and genuine. Uh, and keeping it at a subsistence level doesn't create a state uh, in preserving stability. There should be an approach uh, that I would say, you know, like a Marshall Plan for Gaza, but it would be conditioned on no more Hamas rockets. They can't accumulate, they can't have them. There has to be, this has to be verified. You know, do it in a very high profile way because the people of Gaza will make demands 
on Hamas. Hamas obviously governs through coercion, but they can't be completely indifferent if it looks like everyone there uh, sees that there's a possibility for the future, but Hamas's unwillingness to give up rockets that it can fire into Israel is the reason that uh, a massive reconstruction isn't possible. So we should organize that. That's a way, I think, to, to change at least the reality in Gaza and create an enormous stake and not somehow putting that reconstruction at risk. Who, no one is going to invest big time in Gaza if, if Hamas, at the time of its choosing, can decide, oh, we're going to fire rockets now and put the whole investment at risk. So that's one thing. The other is back on the normalization process. When the UAE made peace with Israel, the condition was twofold. One was what they got from the US, but the other was no annexation. And what's interesting, the Israeli public, when offered the choice, annexation or normalization, 80% supported normalization. Now, as you know, 80% of the Israeli public can't agree on whether or not it's day or night. So here were 80%, you had a very clear, this wasn't a poll in a sense that, you know, you just do it randomly. It was tied to a specific issue in the aftermath uh, of, of the peace offer. And 80% supported normalization. Now, what you could do is you can take, the things are obviously gonna to have to calm down first. But what I would hope is that the Biden administration would assume more of an active brokering approach where you could go, for example, to the Saudis and you could create a menu of steps that they could take towards Israel and what would be the steps they would wanna see the Israelis take towards the Palestinians. Uh, and you could broker that. Palestinians shouldn't just get something and do nothing. What would they do in return? In this way, the normalization process can be used to break the stalemate between Israelis and Palestinians. The gap today between Israelis and Palestinians is so great psychologically, substantively, and even politically that trying to work through that process will go nowhere. But you have this new dynamic that you can build on. It won't be built on by itself. It actually takes an active effort. Ambassador Ross, thank you for coming on such short notice and giving us such a great context. And we'll look forward at some of the consequences and uh, perhaps the future that, uh, that this crisis has presented. Thank you again for your time. We all really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And we want to remind you to be here next week at the same time, same place, to hear Brett Stevens and Michelle Goldberg on opposite sides of cancel culture. The discussion will be moderated by my colleague, Larry Mantle, and uh, you'll be, be sure to want to join us for that. Uh, there's the schedule right on the screen there. And cancel culture, of course, will get a lot of interest, and I hope a lot of questions from all of you. You can see the schedule coming up. Thank you for joining us tonight for this extended edition, both with Ron Brownstein and with Ambassador Ross. Thanks again to the organizers, to Janice and David, and all the supporters of this program. I'm Pat Morrison. Appreciate your joining us. Good night.